Hello and welcome to another Vital NTB test sessions. We're here in Phoenix, Arizona to test five very exciting new school 29ers that I think you're gonna dig. I'm Brandon Terman alongside Steve Wentz and Courtney Steen. Stick around as we break down these five new rides. And at the very end, we're gonna tell you which bike each of us enjoy the most. Game on. So, what is this type of bike all about, and how did they end up in our garage? For starters, these are all a little more party than cross country. They're made to have more fun on the descents and take some influence from the enduro world. The bikes in this test had to meet five requirements. They needed to have 115 to 125 millimeters of rear travel. Up front, we wanted 130 to 140 millimeters of travel to soak up some hits. They needed to be nice and slack in that sub 66 degree head tube angle realm. We give them a bonus for having a short offset fork. They also had to have a lengthy reach, and they had to be 29ers. After a pretty exhaustive search, a surprisingly small number of bikes met this exact criteria. That makes sense though, because these bikes are pushing things in a new direction. Remember, just because they all look similar and have similar numbers doesn't mean that they all ride the same. We tried to keep the builds close to $5,000, and to level the playing field, we swapped out all of the tires to a Maxxis Asagai front and aggressive rear tire combo. Oh yeah, we also wanted a nice steep seat angle. All five of these bikes claim to have a 76 degree or steeper effective seat tube angle. What does that even mean though? And what if you have long legs? <laughs> chips. <laughs> That's hilarious, Steve. Let's dive into some angles and see what's really going on. Okay, this angle equals this angle. If the center of your seat post falls along this line at your saddle height, then the effective seat post angle, that's this one here, is meaningful for you. Traditionally, companies do this for an average height rider for that size of frame. We set all five bikes to Steve's actual 28.5 inch seat height. He's five feet eight inches tall and these are size medium bikes. Then we dropped it to Courtney's seat height. Finally, here it is for those with long legs. If the center of the post is to the left of the red line, it's slacker than the 76 degree effective mark. If it's to the right, it's steeper. Ibis, 71 and a half degree actual seat tube angle. <laughs> Sixty-eight and a half degree actual safety angle. Sixty-eight and a half degree actual seat tube angle. Banshee. 73 and a half degree actual seat tube angle. Santa Cruz, 69 degree actual seat tube angle. As you can see, for a tall rider, there can be a big variance when bikes have a slacker actual seat tube angle. Recognizing this, Banshee publishes their effective seat angle for various saddle heights something we wish more companies would do. Hey nerd, enough numbers. Let's test bikes. 
First up, Banshee Phantom. Though the Phantom has the least amount of travel in the test, it offered impressively capable, stable descending thanks in part to the frame's geometry. The 115 millimeter rear end actually soaks up small chatter surprisingly well. Right from the get-go, it felt super peppy and perfectly balanced, making quick maneuvers and jumping a breeze. It carries momentum well, and when you pump, it really gets up and goes. The combination of less travel out back, a super rampy air spring, plus carbon wheels results in an ultra-precise mini rocket ship feel. The bike has a nice upright pedal position, and it's very efficient uphill. Hands down, the Phantom also got the best parts award with things like Kodar brakes, one-up handlebar, and a carbon wheel set. Going with a more affordable aluminum frame offers the chance for better parts at a similar $5,100 price tag. This lightened the bike to 31.9 pounds, right in line with the Norco, Santa Cruz, and the Marin. Although it may not be the easiest for a beginner, the 130mm MRP fork is also a big highlight. You can control the negative pressure, there are bleeders on the back, and you can quickly adjust the bottom out feel with MRP's ramp control. <laughs> Plush. <laughs> the frame craftsmanship and weld quality is really nice and they don't skimp out on the material. We dig the near net forgings around the shock, the KS2 linkage, and the ability to adjust the geometry with modular dropouts, even if they are a little bit clunky. The bike also has a taller head tube than most and high rise bars for an altogether cleaner look. So I've been messing around with a few different things on the suspension, even though there's not too much to work with travel wise, but firmed everything up and it's awesome best bike in the test for pumping getting speed but it is a little firmer it's not really harsh but it's firmer on bumps so you kind of gotta plow through them and try to skip as much as possible as for downsides that precise feel i mentioned can jostle you in really chunky terrain no matter how well it works and how controlled it is, there is still just 115 millimeters of travel back there, and you're going to get some serious trail feedback from time to time. Due to the pivot location, it also has a fairly limited seat post insertion. Our test bike showed up with a long travel dropper post. This combo initially presented an issue for our two five foot eight inch tall riders, although the one up dropper can be shimmed to a shorter travel amount. The higher standover could also pose an issue for shorter riders. Measuring sag was a little tricky, Mud clearance is a bit snug and it lacks a little in frame protection. Ultimately, the Banshee did just about everything well. Climbing was efficient and descending was fun. Cornering was also intuitive. For many, this bike will embody everything this genre should be. It shows some tough love when you do something wrong and gives you all the reward when you do it right. There's still a healthy dose of cross country in the third generation Phantom that would make it great for pedaling miles and miles, but it's been positively influenced by Banshee's bigger, burlier rides. And now for the slackest bike in the test, the $4,500 Norco Optic C2. It wasn't that long ago that a 65 degree head angle was downhill bike territory, as the only bike to offer a slightly longer travel 140 millimeter fork, plus it's 125 millimeter rear end, the Optic seems poised for business. It sports a carbon front triangle aluminum rear and weighed in at 31.5 pounds. Knowing the influence good suspension can have on a bike, the Optic comes equipped with a custom super deluxe shock with a special damper tune and size. Norco also has an in-depth, interactive, ride-aligned suspension setup guide. Right away, you can tell the Optic is incredibly fun underfoot with just enough progression to keep from slamming through what little suspension it really has in the first place. There's a fair amount to push into on the Optic, which results in a predictable response with a controlled, stable ride feel. It has a firmer high-speed compression tune to really lay into corners and jump lips. This adds to a bit of an up-on-top feel, not in a precarious way, but you don't feel deep down inside the bike like you do on some others. Still, we had a lot of confidence on this bike, making it among the first we'd grab from our lineup for more challenging trails. The Optic does a great job of disguising its travel numbers and feeling like it is more capable and fun than any short travel bike should be. Progressively longer chain stays on each size ensure that it has a consistent feel for all riders, and low standover heights and seat tubes allow for shorter riders and longer travel dropper posts. While you do get that carbon front end, some of the parts were a disappointment. The brakes and rudders left a lot to be desired. Nurko also chose to put carbon cranks on the bike, and we would happily give those up for an improved pair of stoppers. The shifting was also subpar, and the sum of those parts made the optic feel cheaper than it was. Though the performance was great, 
The shock's rebound adjustment range left something to be desired, leaving two of our testers between clicks. Due to the suspension tune, lighter riders may also feel a bit more in the rocks. The bike can feel a bit heavier when pedaling, and this could be due to lower anti-squat values, which can be really nice for technical climbing, but make it lag in other terrain. It just doesn't have that featherweight feel of the Ibis or the precision of the Banshee. Overall, we thought the ride of the Optic was awesome. It truly benefits from having good suspension. It offers a lively ride that can pop off everything and a bit more travel for a controlled feel on rougher trails. Due to the spec though, we'd recommend opting for a nicer spec on an aluminum version with the same geometry or saving up for the higher end model with better components. Moving on to the Ibis Ripley V4. This full carbon frame sees 120 millimeters of DW Link rear suspension with a 130 millimeter fork. Due to availability, we had to go with a size large on this one and a slightly more expensive $5,500 GX build. Component highlights include the bike yoke dropper with a reset valve and super wide Ibis rims. Dollar Way Club. Who's in? What? Who's in? I'm in. I'm in. All right. <laughs> 30 pounds, two ounces. 30 pounds, three ounces. <laughs> He's such a, <laughs> such a shyster. I'll go whatever you guys didn't say. I think Steve won. At 29.7 pounds, this was the lightest bike in the test by a wide 1.8 pound margin. It's a lot. And that crosses over to the trail. We actually rated it as the best climber of the bunch. This is aided by higher than average anti-squat values and the low 25% rear sag value that IBIS suggests. IBIS seems to have approached their suspension damping and spring curves with different intentions, and it feels like it while riding. It's light, nimble, you feel on top of the bike, and there's great efficiency when you're putting down the power. The Ripley is stable at speed, and the rear wheel is able to get up and out of the way pretty easily through rougher, chunkier terrain. Because of these traits, we think it'd be one of the least fatiguing in the lineup on longer rides. The pillowy ride feels light and smooth with lots of give when you push into it, but it's a bit of an old school feel that's firm up top and goes through the travel pretty easily. That didn't help when jumping or especially during turn-in, where the first firm part of the suspension could make it feel like we were riding on eggshells. Despite using a shorter offset fork, we also felt it knife in on some turns, which was a little odd. So the Ibis feels awesome climbing uphill. It sits up high in its travel, you're above the bike, and it feels really efficient. One of the downsides to this uh, feeling is that when you're on loose over hard pack, it's still a little firmer where you're sagging in and where you're starting to initiate corners. So it feels like it wants to slide, I think more than other bikes. Uh, the similar shock is also on the Santa Cruz, but that one feels really different. That one feels heavier, has a little more traction. This one feels lighter. feels like it has a little less traction. So a couple different things that you can go for in a bike. This bike is pretty linear with just 4% of progression, so it reaches the end of its travel without too much of a huck. Luckily, it does so in a smooth way that's not overly harsh when you bottom out. Ultimately, the Ripley is balanced, light, and nimble with an accurate steering feel, good rolling efficiency, and power transfer. Those traits make it feel fast and capable, and it would be a great choice for people that value climbing as much, if not more, than descending. However, going faster or putting a lot of input into the bike can feel like it's fighting what you're doing more than being one with you. It's truly a bike that you get on as opposed to one that you're part of. <laughs> Next up, the Marin Rift Zone Carbon 2. At $4,400, this was the most affordable bike in our lineup. The carbon front aluminum rear triangle frame comes with a 130mm Fox fork up front. That's paired with 125 millimeters of rear travel via the multi-track, linkage-driven, single-pivot suspension design. This one is also pretty progressive. On trail, the Rift Zone felt like the toughest bike in the test. It was stable through lots of different terrain, never felt cheap like it would break, and gave our testers loads of confidence in rougher areas. Like the Norco Optic, the Rift Zone is so predictable and composed that you get the sense that you're on a mid-travel bike, somewhere in the 130 to 140 millimeter range. The added bonus though, it still felt efficient uphill and the bike made it worth it to put in hard pedal strokes. Thanks to the reasonable price point, bomb proof feel and nice touches like the Deity Bars, a PNW loam lever, and a big 200mm front rotor, we think the Rift Zone is a great value. 
It also has good things going for smaller riders with a low standover height and a short seat tube. While it doesn't feel like it's going to do any wrong or surprise you, some may argue that it lacks some personality for the same reason. That stable, planted feeling takes away from the playful nature of this bike just a bit. It lacks a bit of pop and is just a bit of a snooze if you're looking for constant action. This could be in part due to the less supple nature of bushings, not bearings, in the upper shock mount. At 32.4 pounds, it was also the heaviest bike in the test. And despite feeling efficient, the heft could definitely be felt going uphill. It was also equipped with an overly creaky FSA crank set. You can feel that sound. Best $5 upgrade, earplugs. Bottom line, aside from the cranks, it's hard to find a true weakness with the Rift Zone. This is a bike that many riders can enjoy for a long time. It offers the ability and confidence to point and shoot, aim the bike, and go. It's a capable climber and descender that feels controlled in both roles. For those who enjoy popping and pumping the trail though, it can feel a little ho-hum. What about the Santa Cruz Tallboy? This bike slots in at 120 millimeters rear, 130 millimeters front, and we tested the $5,000 S build with a full carbon C-series frame. For those in search of a women's version, know that it shares the same frame as the Juliana Joplin. This bike got updated recently with Santa Cruz's easy to grease lower link VPP suspension design. The rear shock mount offers adjustability with a high low flip chip and there is a full centimeter of chainstay adjustment by swapping the dropouts. The Tallboy strengths include great cornering manners with the lowest bottom bracket height of the bunch. It also has a very progressive suspension feel that has hints of playful possibilities with plenty in the reserves for bigger stuff. Once the front and back were better matched up in terms of suspension pressure and support, the Tallboy was a confident descender, offering the most traction of the group both up and down. All but our tallest tester felt very in the bike on the Tallboy, giving them a great deal of trust that things wouldn't hit the fan at a moment's notice. While the part spec is solid on its own, the frame is a major highlight of the bike. The geometry was good for men and women alike, the suspension worked well, and the finished details are impeccable. On the weakness front, we do wish measuring sag was a bit easier during setup. It's just hard to get in there and see the shock. The suspension also needed a little tweaking to get the bike's front to back balance where it needed to be. After cranking in compression on the fork and adding a bit more pressure than recommended, the front end could then barely keep up with the rear. The Santa Cruz feels pretty darn progressive. And at first it was feeling like it pitched you out over the front soften the back, kept stiffening up the front, and now it's really fun. The bike also weighed heavier than expected at 31.7 pounds, hampering some of that nimbleness and flickability found in bikes like the Norco or Banshee. The Santa Cruz felt stuck to the ground at times, and while that aided in traction, it could be a detriment when you want to be playful on it. At 5'10", our tallest tester felt as though the bike was a bit too small, so consider sizing up if you ride on the border between sizes. Bottom line, if traction is what you're always hunting for and you want to clean every big climb as much as the descents, the tall boy might be the bike for you. The progressive suspension provides a trustworthy connection to the ground while descending, and heading into corners, there's an earned confidence that the bike is going to stick. It's also among the best values with dialed frame details and a solid build kit. So, what about these slacked out short travel 29ers in general? Is this type of bike something people want to consider? Well, increased terrain feel, the ability to maintain speed well, and the fun that ensues are big highlights. These bikes climb and pedal efficiently while offering enough travel to have a blast on smoother descents. The newer geometry also makes them more adept at tackling challenging sections of the trail, but they'll never truly stack up to a bike with more travel. Then again, these bikes shouldn't take any hit or handle any trail. We see them as a good addition to the quiver for those who ride the full spectrum of trails. For those who primarily ride fast, flowy, pumpy trails with a sprinkling of tech, these could be the ones to rule it all. If you ride in areas with lots of high-speed trail riding where it isn't that rough, bikes like these may make you wonder if you've been overbiked all these years. The combination of monster truck and poppy play bike will also make you reconsider what's possible with five inches of travel or less. Just keep in mind that while they are capable of it, the geometry and parts can outshine what a tiny rear shock can handle. They are also tough to balance sometimes and can get pushed further than they should. My favorite bike for this test was the Banshee Phantom. If you're gonna give up all the travel and really go short travel and nimble, this is a really fun bike that jumps well, handles well, and it's still pretty stable at speed. 
Of all the bikes that we rode, the one that I liked the most was the Santa Cruz. It has the progressive ride that I really like for playing around on trail. And then when I climb it, it doesn't feel heavy and it's really efficient. You know what? I really struggled with this decision because they're all incredible bikes. If I was buying a second bike, I'd be all over that Banshee. If it was my only bike, though, it'd be down to the Marin. I think this bike is incredibly reliable and it offers a little bit more than the other bikes do when it comes to the rough stuff. Thank you guys for joining us for this in-depth look at five rad new rides. Be sure to head over to vitalmtb.com where we've got an in-depth suspension analysis on all the bikes, spec comparison, and relative performance ratings from all of the testers. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you on the trails.